Tonight we speak about a special message that I call Revelation's Most Amazing Prophecy. Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, you've sent a special message to prepare men and women for the soon coming of Jesus. We open our hearts to you just now. Impress us with this message straight from the book of Revelation. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation reveals God's last day message for humanity. Now it's not unusual that God would have a message for this generation especially designed to prepare men and women for the coming of Christ. God always sends a message to prepare his people for major world events which affect their eternal destiny. Now the Bible is not a, primarily a history book, although it touches on history. The Bible does not mention every nation in the world, but where there are large events that impact the entire globe, that impact especially God's people, he brings that to view in history. For example, before the world was destroyed by water, God raised up Noah with a special message to prepare the world for the destruction by water and the flood was coming. Those that accepted Noah's message entered into the ark and were saved. Those that rejected it were swept away by the flood waters and lost. Think about the first coming of Jesus. God raised up John the Baptist to prepare men and women for the first coming of Jesus. Wouldn't it be strange if the world were going to be destroyed by fire and there was no special message to get people ready for the coming of Christ? Wouldn't it be very strange and unusual if God sent a special message through John the Baptist to prepare the world for the first coming of Christ, but he would not have any message for the second coming of Christ. If we were to find a message to prepare people for the second coming of Christ, what book of the Bible do you think that message might be in? What book of the Bible? What book of the Bible? Revelation. The last book of the Bible is specifically designed by God to prepare a people for the coming of Jesus. Revelation's message in chapter 14 is as important for our day as Noah's message was for his day. Revelation chapter 14 is as important for this generation as John the Baptist's message was to prepare people for the first coming of Jesus. It has God's end time message. John, exiled on the island of Patmos, looks up in a glorious vision that God gave to him. And John says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven. What was the angel doing, everybody? What was he doing? He was floating, right? Just kind of floating along. He was not floating, he was flying. Flying indicates speed. Flying indicates rapidity. Flying indicates urgency. So here is an urgent message, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Here is an urgent message that's not simply for one language group, not simply for one ethnic group. Here is an urgent message for humanity that's to go to the ends of the earth. If God has sent an urgent message for all humanity, don't you think it's quite important that we study it? If it's to go to every tribe, every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people, it's to leap across oceans. It's to penetrate into the farthest jungles. It is to reach the, m the large cities of our world. It is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This is a universal message. 
It's a message for all humanity. Now, what event does this message prepare humanity for? Revelation chapter 14 tells us. It says, John says in Revelation 14, verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple. And the angel said, he cried with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, and the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So here, John pictures the Son of Man, Jesus, coming in the clouds of heaven, as a reaper to reap the harvest of the earth. Well, we might ask the question, what is the meaning of Revelation's symbol of harvest? The Bible answers that question. In Matthew, Jesus explained what the harvest was. He says, the enemy that sowed all these seeds was the devil, he sowed evil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. So when Revelation speaks about the harvest, it's speaking about the end of the age. It's speaking about the end of the world. So Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 12, is the message to prepare for the harvest. It's the message to prepare a final generation for the coming of Jesus. The reign of sin will come to an end when Revelation 14's message is completed. So let's look at that message tonight. Let's study that message, that message that is as important for our day as Noah's message was for his day. That message that is to prepare a people to stand alive when Jesus comes. Then I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The first thing that we notice about this message, it's the everlasting gospel. The message that Christ was born. He lived the perfect life that we should have lived. He died the death that we should have died. The everlasting gospel is the gospel that Christ took upon himself the guilt and shame of our sins. That Christ died in our behalf. The everlasting gospel is outlined in John chapter 3 verse 16. You know it well. Say it with me in English if you know it. If you don't, say it in your own language. For God, say it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the gospel. God so loved that he gave. His only begotten Son, Jesus, left the joys of heaven. He left the worship of the angels. And he came to earth that whosoever believes one night. I was preaching far back in the Philippines. I was on a dirt road. And we set up a table and put a lantern on. And the villagers came down and sat on that dirt road. All the children sat in the front row. And I was talking about Jesus. I was talking about this text, God so loved the world that he gave. Whosoever believed, and I said to my audience who had come from the jungle sitting on the dirt road, you can believe, tonight you can have eternal life. But I could see they weren't getting it. I was saying, this is a gift, God wants to give it to you. All you have to do is take it. And everybody was kind of looking at me and I thought, I have, to, I have to do something. So I had something in my pocket, like a pen or something. And I took it out and those children in the front row began to look at this pen. And I said to one child, would you like the pen? Take it. And for some reason I scared the child. He jumped up, ran into the jungle. I went to the second child, would you like the pen? Take it. He jumped up, ran into the jungle. Went to the third child. I reached out, take the pin. He took it and ran into the jungle. <laughs> and all the parents began saying, come back, come back. So the children came back and I said to the first child, do you have the pen? No, I don't have the pen. Do you have the pen? No, I don't have the pen. I said to the third, do you have the pen? He said, oh yes, I have it. 
And I said to the other two, why don't you have it? I didn't take it. Why do you have it? Because I took it. I said, you know what? You can keep that pen. And the other two children said, he can keep it? I said, yeah, because he took it. You didn't take it. Did you take the gift that Jesus offered for you? All you have to do is take it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, belief is an act of faith which you take what Christ offers. We do not earn eternal life. Our good works do not merit eternal life. But tonight, there's somebody listening that has never reached out to Christ and taken eternal life. You can reach out right now and take the life that Christ offers. He that believeth in him should not perish. You need not perish. You can take that gift of eternal life. What is the gospel? First, that Christ died. Second, that he lived a perfect life. And when we take the gift of eternal life, when our name comes up in judgment, Christ steps forth and he says, this man, this woman is one of mine. Yes, they failed, but they took the gift of eternal life and my perfect life covers their failures. Christ's perfect life, his perfect record, is put in the place of our sinful records for all who accept him and follow him. What is the everlasting gospel? It's also that Christ rose from the dead. He lived, he died, he was ro risen from the dead. He is alive, he ascended to heaven. He is your savior and mine. Not only did Christ die for me, but Christ lives for me. Not only did he forgive my past and deliver me from the guilt of sin, he delivers me from the grip of sin. Not only did Jesus take the penalty of sin upon himself, but he gives me power to live a new life. What is the gospel that's to go to the ends of the earth? It is that in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, you can be saved, your life can be changed if you're struggling with some habit in your life tonight. If you're struggling with some great problem in your life tonight, if there's some big mountain before you tonight, the living Christ will give you power to deal with it. Jesus is alive. Teach me to say that in Swahili. Very slow, in Swahili. Jesus is alive. Come up and teach me. Somebody, Pastor Marvaga, come up and teach me, Pastor David. Jesus is alive. Yesu, you high. Yesu? You high. You high. Yesu, you high. Are we ready to say it together? Yesu, you high. Again, Yesu, you high. Jesus is alive. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that tonight? Because he is alive, he can change your life. How can I find personal peace, you ask? By coming to this Christ, by letting him forgive your sin, by coming to this Christ, by receiving his power, by being changed by the gospel. The everlasting gospel is the answer. But the three angels' messages that are to go to all the world go on. Long neglected truths that have been lost sight of by Christianity will be restored. These truths will be based on the Bible, based on the gospel of Christ. So the angel goes on. He says in Revelation 14 verse 7, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Four things. Fear God. Give glory to him, the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. A message for this generation, a message for end time men and women, a message for all humanity. What does it mean to fear God? Does it mean to shake and tremble before him? Not at all. To fear God means to respect or reverence God by obeying him. In the Bible, fearing God means to take God seriously. Fearing God is a state of mind in which I commit my life to Christ to take him seriously. Often in the Bible, 
fearing God or reverencing God is linked to obeying God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 tells us that. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Do what, everybody? Do what? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So if anybody says to you, the commandments of God are done away with because you're saved by grace, grace does not lead us to disobedience. Grace leads us to obedience. God's final message for mankind, his last day message, is to lead men and women to reverence or respect God by keeping his commandments. Look, listen to what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my law. Have many people forgotten God's law today? My son, do not forget my law, but let, my heart, let your heart keep my commands. So in the last days of earth's history, at a time when the law of God is dragged in the street, at a time when adultery is commonplace, at a time when stealing is normal, at a time when Sabbath breaking is regular on many people, at a time when many people take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. God is calling a generation, he's calling men and women back to obedience. The message to prepare people for the coming of Jesus is a message that says fear God, teach your children to obey him, live godly lives of respect, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. What does it mean to give glory to God? Fearing God has to do with an attitude of mind in which I take him seriously and commit my life to obey him through his grace. Giving glory to God has to do with the way I live. For example, Giving glory to God, the Bible tells us about that. What does it mean to give glory to God? We find it in the book of Corinthians. To give glory to God means to honor him in my lifestyle. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, give glory to God. So we give glory to God as we care for our bodies. Can I give glory to God if I'm smoking away dope and drugs? Can I give glory to God that way? Can I give glory to God if I'm dousing my body with alcohol and fogging up my brain? Can I give glory to God if I'm eating those foods that the Bible tells me not to eat? Is that giving glory to God? Can I give glory to God if I'm promiscuous in immorality? The Bible says in the final generation, the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. Men and women will be saved by grace. They'll be led to obey God. They'll be led to give glory to God in their lifestyle, in every single thing that they do. That's why we have the messages of health here at our meetings. Not simply to help people to be healthy so they can sin more because they're healthy. But, the, but health is part of God's three angels' messages in Revelation to get a people ready to meet their Creator when He comes again. Health is part of God's last day message for humanity. When we make a decision to follow Christ, He gives us the power to change habits in our life that are unhealthful. Notice what the Bible says, though, fear God and give glory to Him and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. When it says worship him who made heaven, earth, the sea and the springs of water, who is the one that made heaven, earth and the sea and the springs of water? What do we call him? Who is this message calling us to worship? It's calling us to worship the creator, the creator of heaven and earth. Why is Jesus, you know, Ephesians 3 verse 9 says that God created all things through Jesus Christ. Why is Jesus worthy of our worship? Why is God worthy of our worship? If we evolved from 
primitive forms of life and from animal and so forth, if we evolve from that, God wouldn't be worthy of our creation because he didn't create us, right? But the Bible says God created us. We did not evolve. God created us. Because he created us, the very basis of worship is the fact that God created us. I did not choose to live. Life is a gift of God. Life is a what? Gift. Did you choose to be born? Did you choose to say, you know what? I don't think I'd like to be a cow. That wouldn't be good. I don't think I'd like to be an elephant. That wouldn't be good. I don't think I'd even like to be a mosquito. Did you choose not to be an elephant? Did you choose not to be a giraffe? Did you choose not to be a mosquito? God, in his divine wisdom, brought together the genes and chromosomes. And God brought together you. And you are God's creation. And the psalmist sings out, rather, the, the, John, the revelator, sings out, in Revelation 4.11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Why is it that God is worthy of our worship? Because he created us. Has he left a sign of his creative authority? How do we worship him as creator? We worship him as creator by keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Because he says in Exodus 20, verse 11, Remember the Sabbath day to what? Keep it holy. Why? Why did God say remember? Why to remember? Why to remember the Sabbath? Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but what? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. So Revelation's last day message, now follow the sequence so closely. Revelation's last day message is a message of the everlasting gospel of men and women saved by grace. When they are saved by grace, they fear God or obey God by keeping his commandments. They give glory to God in their bodies and in their lifestyle. And they worship their creator by keeping the seventh day Sabbath. The Sabbath message is part of a last day message to prepare men and women for the coming of Jesus. So we've noted three things. This special message says, obey God. What's the second thing that it says? Glorify God. What's the third thing that it says? Worship God. Now, it tells us in this first angel's message what we're supposed to be doing, obeying God, giving glory to God, worshiping God. It tells us why we are supposed to do it, and it tells because he's the creator. We obey him because he's the creator. We glorify him because he's the creator. We worship him because he's the creator. And it tells us why it's so important. Why? Revelation 14:7. Fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment has come. So this message says that God's judgment hour is here and that the destiny of all humanity will soon be decided when Jesus comes. The hour of God's judgment has come. We are living not in common time. We are living not in usual time. We are living at an unusual time in Earth's history, the hour of God's judgment. So Revelation is a book of choices. Revelation is a book that leads men and women to be prepared for the coming of Christ so that our eternal destiny can be settled. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11 and 12. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. 
So when Jesus comes, he comes to give out his reward. Now, if Jesus is coming to give out his reward, there must be a judgment before he comes to determine what reward men and women will receive when he comes. Do you follow me? If Christ is coming to give out his rewards, there must be a judgment before he comes to determine who receives what reward when he comes. So the destinies of all human beings are now being settled. Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. This is the time to make our eternal choice for Christ. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, that there will come a time when every human being will have made their final decision. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. I'd like you to think back on Noah's day. Was there a day in Noah's day that the door of the ark was open? Was there a day? Was there a day that the door of the ark was open? But was there a day after Noah preached for 120 years that the door of the ark was shut? Could anybody enter the ark after the door was shut? Could they enter it then? They couldn't. The door was shut. Now, there, today, probation's door is open. Every human being who desires to receive the grace of Christ can receive it. But will there be a day when probation's door is closed? Now, probation's door closes not because God runs out of mercy, but probation's door closes because everybody on planet Earth has already made their decision. The choices that we make tonight will eventually determine our eternal destiny. One day, every man, every woman, every child, as God looks down, he will say, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. This is our divine opportunity to make our decision for Christ. The Holy Spirit's working on your heart. Wherever you are tonight, you're not watching this by accident. You may be driving in your car and listening to this by Adventist World Radio. God's speaking to you, to you tonight. You may be watching by Hope Channel. God's speaking to you tonight. You may be listening on one of the media platforms, or you may be here in the New Life Church. God is speaking to you tonight. This is our hour. Three angels flying in the middle of heaven, calling men and women to accept Christ, calling men and women to obey Christ, calling men and women to give glory to Christ, calling men and women to worship the Creator on the Bible Sabbath, calling men and women to, to get ready for the coming of Jesus. But then, this message of the first angel is a call to accept the everlasting gospel. It's a call to loving obedience. It's a call to give glory to God in all of our lives. It's a call to worship the Creator. It's a call at this urgent time of Earth's history to live godly lives in the light of the judgment. It is truth revealed for an end time generation and error exposed. But a second angel flies. And the second angel says, and another angel followed, the first one saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. In the Bible, wine represents false doctrine. What happens when you drink wine? It, it clouds your mind. You cannot think clearly. You know, one night, I was outside of Chicago. I was preaching on the wine of Babylon, and a drunk man walked into the meeting. He fell asleep during half the sermon in the back. He was drunk. But I began to preach, and I said, 
Wine affects your brain. Wine affects, and you can't think clearly. And the man stood up. He said, that's enough, preacher. That's enough, preacher, the drunken man. Well, we had to usher him out and pray over him that God would help him to get sober. But what does wine do? It does affect the brain, doesn't it? But this is not talking about literal wine. This is talking about false doctrine. All nations would drink of the wine of false doctrine. False doctrine would come into the church through false religious system called Babylon. And God says, come out of Babylon. Come to the gospel. Come to Christ. Come to the power of God. Come to obedience to God's commandments. Come to give glory to God in your body. Come out of those false doctrines of sun worship. Come, God says, to the truth of worshiping the Creator. We're living in the judgment hour. And Jesus says, come and come and come. John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. God's word is true. Come from the traditions of men. Come from the falsehood of evil. Come from doctrines that have been compromised. Jesus says, do not stay in those religious organizations that have compromised Bible truth, but a third angel follows them. Saying with a, saying with a, what kind of voice everybody does a third angel say with? I didn't hear you. What kind of voice does the third angel say with? A loud voice. Why a loud voice? So nobody would miss it. If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. If you take the wine of Babylon, the false doctrines of Babylon, you will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. I don't want the wine of the wrath of God, do you? So God says, this is my call to your heart. Then he concludes this message, Revelation 14 verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. That's here are the endurance of the believers. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God will have an end time people that are committed to Jesus. Jesus' faith lives in their heart. They do not compromise his truth. They keep the commandments of God. So there is a contrast between Revelation 14 verse 7 and Revelation 14 verse 9. In Revelation 14, 7, it says, worship the Creator. In Revelation 14, verse 9, it says, do not worship the beast. Then in Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, those that worship the Creator, those that do not worship the beast, keep the commandments of God. So there will be, according to Revelation, and we'll unpack this more as the lectures go on, I introduce this message tonight. That's why you do not want to miss one night. These messages are designed to prepare a people for the coming of Jesus. Notice what it says in the text. Worship the Creator, don't worship the beast. And then it goes on to say, God will have a people. In the last days of earth's history, when the mark of the beast is enforced, God will have a people at a time when no man can buy or sell. At a time when a death decree goes out, God will have a people that the faith of Jesus is living in their heart. Through grace, by grace, because of grace, they will not yield. By God's power, through God's power, in God's power, they will not compromise their integrity. They will stand firm as God's men and women in a final generation. And God is calling men and women today of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people to follow him. God's last day message warns us against the devil's deceptions in these last days. It's an appeal to surrender completely to God. It's an appeal not to hold anything back. Look, if you are holding something back from Christ today, how are you going to stand when the mark of the beast is enforced? If you're toying around with sin, if you're half committed to Christ, if you're not fully committed, how are you going to stand then? If we cannot stand with the little trials now, if we cannot stand now with the problems that we face, if we cave in to the social pressure around us today, how will we stand then? 
God is preparing us today for tomorrow. God is preparing us now for the future. God is leading a people to be totally committed to him many years ago. But there was a little boy. And this little boy was crossing the street. He was hit by a, by a motorcycle, knocked down near death on the street, bleeding. The medics found him. The medical professionals came with an ambulance. They rushed him to the hospital. He needed a blood transfusion. Now in those days, when the doctors did a blood transfusion, they took a man's arm, found somebody with the same blood type as that person, and they took a needle, stuck it in the vein of the one that was giving the blood, and blood passed through a plastic tube into the one that was receiving the blood. This boy was dying. This boy needed blood. They looked for a blood donor who had the same kind of blood. They found one, the boy's father. And the boy's father came to the operating theater. And as he came to that theater, the doctor said, Sir, your blood will save the life of your son. They took the needle, pricked the father. Blood began flowing through that plastic tube into that little boy's body. And the father watched the blood flow. And he said to the doctor, Doctor, if you need to, take it all. Doctor, if you need to, take every drop of my blood. When Jesus hung on Calvary's cross with nails through his hands and blood running down his face, blood pouring from his wrists, he said to his father, Father, take every drop of my blood for my people because I can't stand being in heaven if they're not there with me. Because he gave his all for us, he invites us to give our all for him. Because he held nothing back from us, he invites us to hold nothing back from him. If tonight you want to say to Jesus, and mean it from the depths of your heart, Jesus, take it all. Jesus, I want to be ready for your coming. Jesus, we're living in the judgment hour. Jesus, I want to be prepared for your coming. Jesus, take it all. You gave all for me. Jesus, take my life tonight. If that is your decision, would you stand up right now?